In the deep dark, the Aslan are moving, but there is a darker power. There is something behind the claw. Welcome to episode 26 of the Behind the Claw podcast, a show for fans of the classic traveller RPG. I'm Felbrick Napoleon Herriot. Now let's start the show by taking a look in the email vault. Ah, Sylvain has emailed in from Montreal with a sad, sad admission. Having been playing RPGs for 30 years, Traveller isn't a game he's played. I know, I I know, calm down. There is hope for him yet. He's asking all the right questions. He starts by asking, what's the best source for the rules? For the original Traveller, often referred to as Classic Traveller, the quickest and easiest is to drop by drive through RPG. There you'll find many different versions of Traveller, even of Classic Traveller, but that, I'm afraid, is the cost of having such a long-lived game. Option one is to pick up the PDFs of the original Little Black Books. If you type in CT-B01 into the search, you'll get the PDF for the first Little Black Book. But to be honest, you'll want to get the first three books if you go this route. That's CT-B01, B02 and B03. The second option is to search on drive through for Starter Traveller. This is a reprint and reorganisation of the original rules. You basically get the same content, still in the three PDF books, but with the charts and tables all separate and in a separate book to themselves. And as a bonus, you'll get some adventure material. Both of these options are equally good in my opinion. Another alternative is to get the $35 CD of all the classic rules and material in PDF form directly from farfuture.net. This is pretty good value for money but does rely on the old-fashioned snail mail. If you want to trawl eBay, you can pick up the classic Traveller books, but they're a bit of a collector's item these days. But if you're looking on eBay for Traveller, be warned. There are other versions of Traveller, such as Mega Traveller, T4, and even nowadays, T5. I can't remember much about Mega Traveller, except that it felt inferior to the classic version when I had it back in the 90s. T4, well... That should just be avoided like a plague. And as for T5, well, I don't really know. I've heard it's a bit of a disorganised mess, but I haven't seen it myself. And if that wasn't enough, there's also the version Mongoose published, known simply as Mongoose Traveller. I've got this version too, and I proclaim it a worthy successor to the classic version that I love. Search on Drive Through RPG for Mongoose Traveller, and you'll find it's a game that's almost entirely backwards compatible with classic Traveller but has filled in some of the gaps and modernised some of the mechanisms. Your second question is, how do I handle science within the game? I'm not quite sure I know what you mean. I tend to treat machines created by science, such as ships, engines, computers, laser guns, just as you would in any other role-playing game. As an example, in a modern world zombie survival game, when the car engine breaks down, I don't need to know the workings of the internal combustion engine, or how the braking system works and neither did the players. It's simply a skill role, or an intelligence role, and it's just the same in Traveller. The ship's jump engines are broken down, it's a skill role to fix them. Shooting a laser gun, well, that's no different to firing a bow or a six gun. Running computer checks is a skill role too, like casting a spell. The mechanisms are the same, the words or the technologies are just different. Well, I hope that's put your mind at rest, and encourages you to get hold of the game. So welcome to the worlds of Traveller. Now, on to the first segment. I have no idea. So, computer, what can you tell me about this place? This is the My Galaxy segment, where I tell you about a planet in my Tassesso subsector. A map and planetary UPPs are available on the podcast's website at behindtheclaw.blogspot.co.uk. Ukaru is a big, heavy G world that has an economy based around farming. Its atmosphere is very high in carbon dioxide, and its land surface, where not cultivated, is covered in thick, luxuriant jungle that both maintains and thrives in the low-oxygen mix. 
Visitors are advised to always wear an oxygen mask and carry spare oxygen tanks if venturing far from the sealed habitats. The atmosphere contains free oxygen, usually in the range of 5 to 6 percent, which means that you can breathe it for a very short while, a matter of minutes, before suffering serious ill effects. The population of 10 or so million is split into two major strata. Orbiting the planet in a series of space stations is a population of roughly 500,000, with the remainder of the populace living on the surface in small domed communities. The habitation domes are inflatable and not protective in nature, their only purpose being to retain an atmosphere with a higher concentration of oxygen to make living more comfortable. Life on the planet is strictly controlled by those in orbit who make demands of the ground dwellers in produce that they ship into orbit for sale off-world. There is no ground port, but every community has its own shuttle pad. Once each year cargo shuttles land on these pads to collect produce for carriage to orbit and then drop off various goods to these communities. Although there is an underlying contempt for spacers in the ground communities, they tend to welcome off-world shuttles that bring trade goods. However, such trade is overseen and controlled by those that live in the stations, and trading arms or credits to the ground communities is strictly forbidden. In many ways, the ground dwellers are free individually, able to create businesses, build roads, manufacture goods, etc. But always with the oversight and permission of those in orbit. There have been in the past attempts by groups within the ground dwellers that strived for freedom from what they called the tyranny of the stationers, once even going so far as to commandeer a shuttle and storm one of the stations. This rebellion was savagely put down with all the people who invaded the station being put to death, and the destruction of the three communities from whence they came. It is therefore an uneasy piece, but not a particularly stressful one. There is little that the ground dwellers are prohibited from doing, and therefore they resent rather the rule than the oversight. No, no, no way. The way I heard it is that he was shipping arms, guns, you know, taking them straight in, under the navvy's nose. It's time for another story seed. The PCs are contacted by Kyle Richies, a rich businessman who needs someone to carry out some subtle undercover investigation. Kyle is one of the two major shareholders of a large petrochemical company called Foo. The issue that he wants investigated rises from the fact that until recently he was one of six major shareholders. The other four have all died of brain hemorrhages within a period of three months. The partnership that they all signed up to had a clause that meant that the shares of the deceased partners reverted to ownership by the remaining shareholders. Thus Kyle is very suspicious of the other remaining partner, a Mr Hilliard Benton. Kyle fears for his life and suspects poison has been used. He wants the PCs to watch Hilliard, keep track of his movements, see if he's meeting any dodgy-looking individuals, killers maybe. Can they find out if he's been buying poison? And has he any contacts with Kyle's servants, possibly offering them money to poison him? But here's the twist. It's Kyle that's been killing off the partners, and he hasn't been using poison. He has with him an unregistered psionic kept prisoner, and has been using the prisoner's psionic skills to kill his partners. The prisoner has himself been poisoned, and is kept alive by Kyle by feeding him the antidote daily. Thus he remains under Kyle's control. However, for the psionic to attack the target, he needs to know where he'll be and when he'll be there. That's why Kyle has hired the PCs, to keep an eye on Hillard and track his movements. After the PCs make their first report of Hillard's movements, he will start having fainting fits and look unwell a lot of the time, due to the attacks being made by the psionic. Give the players a chance to see that Hilliard is going downhill and raise their suspicions that they're working for the bad guy. Of course, this opens various courses of action. Will the PCs try to take Kyle down? Will they blackmail him? Will they try to free his psionic slave once they find him? Any of these three approaches can have exciting repercussions and Kyle is already a murderer, so he's not going to let any snotty thugs for hire stop him from achieving his aims. 
No, sir. You may not dock here. What the hell? I just made three jumps to get here. Without Permit 7C, you may not dock. Now move out to the holding line at 6,000 kilometres. This is Rules Talk, where I look at some aspect of the classic traveller rules or canon. And in variance with what I've just said, I thought I'd talk about something that's not covered by the rules. And that's the PC's reputation. Good, bad, indifferent. How do NPCs see, know of, or relate to the PCs? I have to admit that, in my games, this has always been a case of hand-waving, with occasional reference to the NPC reaction chart in Book 3. I think the reputation of the party will be reflected in three ways. Word of mouth, which might happen in the dark underground markets and dives. Press coverage, in which lots of people hear of you for good or ill. And finally, digital or official reputation, such as credit scores, trade records and so forth. The effects of the various types would grant different reactions from the people you meet. Lauded in the press, and you might get wannabe fans dropping at your PC's feet. Word of mouth might make people scared of you. And a digital reputation is going to get you a stock response from the people who deal with such things. So, considering that reputation can be a number of different things, I'm not sure it would be worth trying to make a house rule for reputation, as all the bits and nuances that go to make up a reputation do seem to be represented in the system by other means. For instance, the player's social standing stat is likely to have an effect in one type of crowd. The streetwise skill might well account for the seedier places, and there are a few places in the rules when the number of terms served gives a plus or minus DM on reaction, which might be a combination of reputation and presence. Now, having said that, a reputation could be a party statistic that you assign a starting value to and then they have to raise or lower it as part of a campaign goal. Do visible good deeds to raise it, but fail at any point and it goes down. There's a lot of story-driving potential here. Perhaps the PCs work for a political patron that needs great public esteem, so she hires the PCs to help out in the background. Alternatively, you might have to cause public distractions to prevent some other misdemeanours becoming well known to the public, effectively burying the bad news. So I'm going to wind up these thoughts on reputation now with an 80s audio reference. Bonus points to anyone who recognises it. Wait a minute. I know who you are. Yeah, but I heard you were dead. I am. <sighs> ah. Damn piece of junk. Who bought this anyway? <clears throat> no. No, don't you dare say it was me. This is the review segment, and today's review is of... Well, I'll let DM Mike tell you. Hello, classic traveler folks. This is DM Mike of the Save or Die podcast. I'd like to thank Behind the Claw for letting me uh, give a quick review on a novel that came out last year by the name of Agent of the Imperium. It was authored by Mark Miller. That's right, THE Mark Miller, creator of the Traveler role-playing game. And naturally, when I heard that it was a novel set in the Third Imperium, I snapped it up as quick as I could. I had read the Paul Kidd Traveler's novels, but while they more or less were faithful to the technology of the Traveler role-playing game, it was in a totally different campaign world. So, naturally, getting a chance to read about the Third Imperium, I leapt at the chance. Now, there are minor spoilers, so be warned. I was torn after reading the book. On the one hand, it was nice to read about the old Third Imperium, and it gave a lot of detail for pre-1105 gaming. But in some ways, it was kind of flat. The main character is actually someone whose brain engrams have been recorded on a computer wafer, and as such uh, is only revived when there was a crisis that a decider is needed to resolve. So the book has a feeling like a bunch of short stories, different events occurring different places all throughout the Third Imperium, the only connector being this agent. 
sort of like Asimov's Foundation series, which was always connected by the psychohistorian Harry Seldon. Though this is in first person, so you get the interview, the viewpoint of the agent. Unfortunately, that's part of the problem. These events are so split apart in time and space that you can't really get a good grasp on any characters. Most of them seem pretty cardboard. The other thing I didn't like about the book, and I realize that this is probably a good thing in the long run, but I just didn't enjoy the amount of remedial information in it. Of a 340-odd page book, 55 pages of it is history and tech explanations for the Third Imperium. Now, granted, if you're a classic traveler person like myself, you don't need any of this information. But on the other hand, if he's putting the book out to try to get people interested in the Traveler universe, this stuff is vital and is certainly has precedent in Weber's Honor Harrington novels and such like. I So in the end, I enjoyed it, but I just wasn't thrilled with it. I would say that if you are a classic traveler person like myself, it will be a three jumps out of five. A good read, but nothing to rush out and, and desperately grab before the end of whatever. If you don't know the classic traveler background or the third Imperium, I'd give it a four jumps out of five. I hope this review has been of use, and I'm jumping to the next sector. This is DM Mike signing off. Did you hear that? What the hell do you think it is? Is it dangerous? This is the Creature Catalogue, where I tell you about one of the alien creatures that can be found in and around the Imperium. On its homeworld, the Dagar is considered a threat and a pest. To off-worlders, it appears almost cute, almost dog-like, and the way the locals abuse and mistreat them is seen as horrifying in many people's eyes. The Dagar itself is a cold-blooded subterranean quadruped, weighing in the region of 30 to 40 pounds when fully grown. In general outline, it does appear fairly dog-like, sharing the same body and head shape. However, it differs in a few important ways. The tail is flat and wider at its tip than at its base. Instead of padded paws, it has long, wide claws. These curl over in the style of a raptor, but have wide, flat tips, and when not digging with these claws, the Dagar curls them under and walks on the claws themselves. It is also covered by a thin, downy fur, and has facial whiskers, which add to the animal's dog-like appearance. This is not a coat of insulation, however, but rather a sense organ. The whiskers are used in intraspecies communication, and for sensing the surroundings in the dark of the passages that they live in. The reason for the home world's hatred of the Dagar is that the species has a history of destroying man-made buildings by undermining them. Dagar generally live in communities, ranging in size from tens to thousands, and as they live in self-built tunnel systems, they excavate very extensive tunnels. More than once, human buildings have been undermined and collapsed into Dagar complexes beneath. Everything from single homesteads to power stations, and on one occasion an entire town, have been systematically undermined to the point of collapse. The animal is not aggressive, and these collapses were not part of some coordinated attack, but simply the result of the Dagar's propensity to overmine. Similar collapses have been repeatedly observed in areas where there were no humans. It's simply that when the Dagar digs out too much soil, the ground collapses. This kind of destruction rarely wipes out an entire community, and the remaining individuals simply continue on, often re-tunnelling into the collapsed areas. Over time, an area inhabited by Dagar acquires a crater-like appearance, as the spoil is pushed to the surface in a ring around the community, and subsequent collapses lower the terrain within that ring. There is a persistent story, that in the early days of the planet's settlement, 
a troop of the planetary army descended into a Dagar tunnel system in an attempt to wipe them out, but were never seen again. Theories and stories circulate about this, and those that want to wipe out the entire Dagar population use it as a rallying cry and a call to action. So I'm here. Why don't you tell me why you're cold? Bill Spacer in the corner booth. Oh, don't stare at him. I see him. Who is he? It's the guy on the news vids. Which news vids? There are thousands of channels. Crook watch. Ah, I see. This is the People of Interest segment, where I tell you about someone from the Imperium that's basically got a bit of a reputation. Johann Bullitt is now Mayor of Gierhon. The title Mayor is a little misleading. It's actually a role much more like a dictator on the space habitat where he holds the title. Johann rose to this lofty position from that of a lowly police detective in an almost overnight popular uprising. Gierhon is a habitat of about half a million people, built around a small moon. It started as a small prison dome and grew over time first to cover the entire surface, and then to expand upwards. Now the moon at its core is lost from sight, and from the memory of many. The population is no longer made of prisoners, but rather generations of the prisoners' descendants, and some of those of the guards too. The prison was closed many generations ago. Because of this penal history, the social position of the police force was rather uneasy with the population, they used to treat them in equal portions with disrespect or uneasy acceptance. So into this situation, Johann's police career was launched. After serving through the ranks, he rose to the position of detective. On his first day at this rank, he was allocated by the police computer the next homicide, as it was reported. The homicide victim turned out to be the Princess Thule. The royals of Gierhon held an honorary position and were generally loved by the populace, so her murder created a lot of trouble and unrest. Johann's superiors removed him from the case as soon as they realised who the victim was. Johann, understanding the political ramifications of the case, stepped aside, but started working on it in his own time. After a month or so, the official case was closed under somewhat mysterious circumstances. Johann, however, was able to carry on in his own unofficial capacity. After some months of work, he uncovered the guilty party, the incumbent mayor's son. It turned out that the mayor had used his political pressure to shut down both the police investigation and the press coverage. Johann, realising that his own life might be endangered if his investigation was discovered, he carefully laid a plan to release the facts anonymously to the press. As you can imagine, when the story broke, the political upheaval was tremendous. The mayor and his son were lynched in the turmoil. The population wanted to know who had broken the case, and the police turned to investigating who had released the truth to the press. In time, they found and outed Johann. By popular demand, he was elevated to the rank of mayor, a position that he accepted readily. Once he was elected to the position, his life up to that point was, of course, combed through by the press, who wanted to publish every facet of information they could find about the public's new hero. Much of his life had been dreary and humdrum, but one incident from his past rose up to haunt his present. In his teenage years, he had accidentally shot another teenager with an antique slug-thrower. The youth had died, Normally, the role of mayor was limited to people with perfectly clean, unblameable pasts. But here was Johann already in the position when these facts emerged. The press printed story after story. Officials feared that there might be a popular uprising against Johann, and slowly started preparing the militia to be called out. Yet there was no uprising, no outrage. The people simply accepted the facts as if they didn't matter, and Johan continues in his role to this day. Thanks for the trade, Tuchel. It was a pleasure doing business with you. So long, sucker. And so we've reached the end game. But I would like to take the opportunity to tell you about a Kickstarter that I'm currently running. 
It's probably near the end by the time you hear this. I've designed a game called Mecha Strike Force Omega, which is a card game played on a board, and I'm trying to raise money to buy the artwork for this game. I can design games, I'm just not a particularly good artist. Alexis Spitzin has agreed to sell me the rights to use his awesome Mecha artwork. All I need is the funds to buy it off of him. I therefore encourage you to check out the Kickstarter for Mecha Strike Force Omega and see if any of the pledge levels take your fancy. You can pledge for the print and play game or even for audiobooks that I've recorded, including books by Lovecraft and Edgar Rice Burroughs. So once again, and as usual, if you have thoughts, suggestions, questions, segment items or story ideas, please send them into Behind the Claw at Outlook.com. This podcast is released on an attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Its home on the web is at behindtheclaw.blogspot.co.uk. Music by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. I'm your host, Felbrick Napoleon Herriot. Thanks for listening. Prepare for jump. <laughs>